live from London, England, it's theCUBE. Covering AWS Summit London 2019. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services. Welcome to the AWS Summit in London's Excel Center. I'm Susanna Streeter and Dave Vellante is my co-host today on theCUBE. There's been so much to talk about here at the summit today to do with machine learning and AI and I'm really pleased to say that we have uh, two really key people here to discuss this. Uh, we've got Tom, Tom Summerfield who is head of commerce at Foot Asylum uh, and also Richard Potter who is the CEO of Peak. Now you guys have really formed a partnership, haven't you? Foot Asylum is a leisure wear really retailer started in bricks and mortar stores, really moved to online, and Peak is a bit of a pioneer for artificial intelligence systems, really. How yep. did you get together, and uh, what, what kind of sparked, really, your demand, really, for their services, Tom? Yeah, well, so we we knew that we needed to be doing something it, it, with, with data and AI, and we didn't really know exactly what it would be. Um, we were interested in personalization, but then also, in a bigger picture, like a wider digital transformation piece for the business where a well-established bricks and mortar business, but a, and then a, a, gr a fast growing online business. And we were interested to know how we could harness the momentum of the stores to help the digital side of the business and also vice versa. And we, we thought data would be the key and we ended up having a conversation with the guys at Peak and uh, that's exactly what we've been able to do actually on the, on the back of that and deliver we're delivering a hyper-personal experience for our consumers now. I was one of the, the stats that I noticed when looking into to what you've been doing, a 20% increase in email revenue. So that's quite remarkable, really. Yeah. So Richard, tell us you know, how you're able to do this, what kind of services that you lean on to, yeah. to, to, to make those kind of results. Oh, uh, it's, it's a combination of a lot of things, really. Uh, you know, you obviously need um, people who know what they're doing from a, a retail and a business perspective, married with technical experts, data science, algorithms, data. Um, I think specifically how we've done it is uh, Peak's built uh, a, a fairly unique AI system uh, that becomes almost like the, the central brain within our customers' businesses. And off that, um, the algorithms help automate certain business processes and deliver tangible uplifts in business performance, like the 28% uplift in sales here. Um, it, in order to do it, it's, it's quite a long journey. I suppose the outlook we took when we started collaborating was, um, was that if we could deliver that hyper-personalized shopping experience, we were always going to be able to show customers the right product uh, at the right time, and if we were doing that, that we would lead to high brand engagement, higher loyalty, higher uh, and higher lifetime values of, of customers, and that's and that's what's shown to be the case in 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 in, uh, in, in Foot Asylum's example. Yeah, definitely. That that to echo, echo that, you know, the, the hypothesis hypothesis was if you can show the right customer the right product at the right time, then their purchase frequency, average order value metrics all start to move positively, and ultimately then affecting. Uh, their long-term engagement with with our brand, which um, you know increases revenue uh, and and also delivers a a more uh, you know a frictionless consumer experience, hopefully yeah. for the customer. Because I suppose your experience is the same as so many uh, companies out there. They're sitting on this huge pile of data, yet they don't know how to best optimize that data. When yeah. did you first realize, Richard, that there was this kind of gap in the market for peak to grow? Yeah, I think um, data and analytics has come on a bit of a journey, uh, all the way from common sense reporting to more advanced analytics. But when you get to AI and machine learning, what you're talking about is algorithms being able to self-learn and make predictions about things, and that actually fundamentally changes the way businesses can operate. Uh, and, uh, and, a good, and, and in this case, a great example is, you know, we're, we're sending um, hyper-personalized marketing communications to, to every single Foot Asylum customer. Um, they don't realize necessarily that they are tailored to them, but they just become more relevant. But it doesn't require uh, a, a digital marketer to create every single one of those campaigns or emails and, and even trigger the sending of those materials. Um, the brain takes care of that, it can automate it, and what the marketer needs to do is, is feed it engaging content and set up digital campaigns, and then, and, then you, and, then, and then you're left with this capability where AI is saying, you might be a market for this product, let's, let's send you something that might appeal to you. And, uh, and that just gives, um, that gives a marketing team scale, and then as we move into other use cases, like in the supply chain, fulfillment, 
delivery of product, the same thing. The teams just get huge scale out of, um, out of letting algorithms do those things for them. Um, and I suppose the realization for us that there was that gap in the market was just that you can see the outperformance of certain companies. You can see that Amazon attributes 35% of their sales to their machine learning recommendation systems. I think Netflix says 85% of all content is consumed because of its algorithms. Um, and, and if companies like that can harness machine learning to such a great degree, how, does, how, do, how do other businesses do it who can't access that talent pool of Silicon Valley or, glo or, the, or the global, you know, the global talent leaders in tech, and that's that's where we had the insight that as peak, we could create a company that gave our customers the that technology and that capability to mm. to deliver the, the same kind of results that, that Amazon and Netflix get. So, so before the internet, yeah. the brands had all the power. You could price however you wanted. If you overpriced, nobody even even knew. And then the internet was sort of like the revenge of the consumer. AI and data now gives the brands the ability to learn more about its customers, but you have to be somewhat careful, don't you? Because your privacy concerns, obviously GDPR, et cetera. So you have to have a value proposition for the customer, as you were saying, Richard. They may not even know that the machine is providing these offers, yep. uh, but they get value out of it. So how do you guys think about that in terms of the experience for the customer? And how do you draw that balance? I think. For, from my angle, um, that Richard touched on a couple of bits there. To do it at scale, first and foremost, across the entire our, all our, our entire network of consumers, is a, a sort of killer bit element to it. But to and to deliver that personal experience, I think consumers nowadays are so ex they're more expectant of this. Really, uh, we would have considered it innovation uh, a couple of years ago, but now actually it's expected. I think from the consumers, so it's actually in the name of you have to move forward to stand still. So, but we we think we're 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 right at the front of this at the moment, and we're really looking now at how we optimise the journey for the consumer. So that actually we know if we're, we're from some some transactional uh, data that we have, and a little bit of other behavioural uh, data that, you know, we're really conscious of the whole GDPR piece and stuff, and that's really really relevant and super important. Um, and I'm pleased to say that you know we have that you know by, by a peak, it's completely on on, on lockdown from that perspective awesome. as well. Where do the data? Where do the data sources come from? You mentioned some transaction data. Where does the other data come from? Are you using so social data and behavioral data? Where does that come so from? So there's elements of social data. Some of it is a little bit black box, so you can't always access it, and that's a GDPR piece there, and rightly so, actually, in some cases. Um, we have a loyalty scheme which allows us to understand our consumers better in our bricks and mortar retail, which is really cool that we've got some of that transactional data um, on a customer level uh, from the stores. Uh, we know that some people in our sector maybe don't have that, so, that's a, so that allows us to complete the sort of single customer view which then we can aggregate in Peak's brain. Um, then transaction data on the website in the app and bits of uh, browsing, you know, just within our own network, you know, where a customer's potentially been and reacted with something, a piece of content, uh, and journeys within the website, and that's, uh, that's how we build that view. Do you think this is the way that more bricks and mortar stores can survive? Because so many are closing in high streets up and down the UK and in other countries, because simply, they're not really delivering what the customer wants. Yeah, I think, so we, Rich and I both feel quite strongly now yeah. that we're on, we're sort of onto this now a little bit. It's a really as as the, our relationship for the two businesses has evolved, it's become clearer and clearer that actually, with armed with this uh, you know this data at our fingertips, we can actually breathe fresh life into the stores and it, it's pr in, in in the eye of proper true omnichannel retailing, we we don't mind where the cus consumer spends the money. We just need to be always on in a connected environment so that, um, and, and, and as we said before, pushing the right product at the right time. And when they're, when they're in market, we turn up the, mar the message a little bit, but then understanding when they're not in market and maybe to back off them and maybe we warm them up with a little di bit of a different type of message then. And actually we chat, we'd want to challenge ourselves to send like less better marketing communications to our consumers, but absolutely the, the store piece is now. So we, we tail back our store, sort of opening um, strategy as a business to focus more on the digital side of things. But now, 
Um, it's possible that we, we, we might open some more stores now, but it'll be with a more informed strategy of where, 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 why we need to do well, that. Isn't this ironic? The, uh, 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 the brick and mortar marketplace is getting disrupted by online retailers. Obviously, Amazon's the, the big whale in the marketplace. And your answer to that is to use Amazon's cloud services and <laughs> artificial <laughs> intelligence to pave the way for your future. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. astounding when you, when you think about Coming it. Coming full uh, circle. Um, yeah, yeah it's it, it, this sort of unified commerce approach to, uh, you know, there's a place in the world for shops. It's like, it's not, yeah. the romance isn't completely dead and going shopping, yeah, it turns out, you know. Yeah. So, um, and actually, yeah, we're, we're using, harnessing the AWS well, via our friends at Peak. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's some irony there. I think yeah. it's really cool. Though. And, and, and that decision that you made uh, obviously wasn't made, made lightly, but you saw the advantages of working with the cloud uh, outweighing the potential trade-offs of competition. Yeah, I mean, that's not, that was never really a consideration. Really, it wasn't a factor? For, no, I mean, certainly not, no. I think um, this is something that is happening. Um, the, the data and, uh, and harnessing it in a, in a safe, responsible, uh, effective way I believe is the future of all commerce. So, and as far as security is concerned, because of course we have had data breaches, yeah. customers' uh, credit card details yeah. have been accessed. Mm. How do you ensure that it's as secure as possible in, in uh, the way that you you, yeah. you choose the services? I think that come that just comes down to best practice infrastructure, um, and the way we look at it at Peak is. There's no better tools in the world to do that than the same technologies that Amazon themselves use. It's to do with how you configure those services and tools to make it secure. You know, and if, if you have an unsecure open database on a public network, of course that's not secure, but you could have the same thing in your own infrastructure and it wouldn't be secure. So I, I think um, the way we look at it is exactly the same thing. And, and actually, um, being in the Amazon cloud for us gives us a greater comfort, uh, particularly in terms of co-location of data centers and, and like making sure that uh, our application fails over into different locations. It gives us infrastructure we couldn't afford otherwise. And then on top of that, we get all these extra pieces of technology that can make us even more secure than we could do otherwise. We'd have to, in we'd have to employ an army of infrastructure engineers and we don't have to do that because we run on AWS. Okay, so we were able to eliminate all that heavy lifting yep. as the saying goes. You've got this corpus of data. I'm interested in how long it took to get through a POC, train the models, how much data science was involved. How much of a heavy lift was that? Yeah, well, I think uh, for us, uh, well, it's been pretty rapid, actually. We started working together in January last year, um, so we're only really? a, just a sort of year into that. And in that, fa in that entire, uh, so far, um, length of, the, of our relationship, we've gone from hyper-personalizing digital campaigns to recommendation systems on a website, to now um, optimizing customer acquisition on social media and then finally uh, into the supply chain and optimizing demand and so on. And, and I think there's a lot of reasons why we've been able to do it quickly, but that's fundamental to the technologies that, uh, that Peak has built. There's two, there's two sides to it. Our technologies cut out a lot of the friction, so we, 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 didn't, we didn't run a proof of concept. We were able to just pick it up, run with it, and deliver value, and that's to do with, I think, the product that Peak has built. Um, but then you obviously need a, a customer who's who's going on a transformation journey and is hungry to make that make that stick and land mm. it. Um, and then when the two come together, I think that it's an interesting point that though because whilst we at Foot Asylum, we always I always say it's the sort we're not we're not massive but we're not tiny. But it's the sort of place you can turn up on a Monday and say I've had an idea about yeah. something and we're sort of doing it by Friday. That's that's a nice agile culture. It can create some drama as well possibly. <laughs> But I think it, it's really straightforward to get straight into it. And I think this is where some of the bigger, um, sleepier high street retailers that are more fixed in a, in a bricks and mortar world need to not be too afraid to come out and start embracing it because I yeah. think uh, it, some of them are trying now. I think it might be a little bit late for some now, but it's ju it, it's just, it just wasn't that hard really to get going, yeah. yeah. And you've seen the business results. Can you share any uh, measurements or quantification? We've got a really, a really good one uh, that we're just talking about at the moment. Actually, um, we we were able to use the segmentation tools within within the Peak Brain um, to to use them on social, then to create lookalike audiences. So Facebook has some tools where it will help you create audiences that it thinks will be right via its complex algorithms itself. But we almost took a leap ahead of their algorithms by via our algorithms uploading our own segments to create a more sophisticated lookalike audience. 
Um, we produced a, um, a ROAS uh, results, or return on ad spend, uh, if people are not as familiar with that, of 8,400%, uh, wow. which we, we would normally be happy as a business with sort of seven, eight, hundred percent if you're running at that with say an adwords campaign or something like that you that's quite an efficient campaign so to add a zero we were a bit like it felt um yeah you know like it's a mistake that you know yeah. that's not yeah. can't be right <laughs> yeah but not so that's wow. super cool and that's really that's really opened our eyes to the potential of harnessing uh, the, the the you know our sort of the pki brain to then uh, bring it onto social and, and do more outward um, advertising on there, yeah. So yeah. moving the goalposts meant that you achieved a really high score. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Very <laughs> much. Thank you very much for telling us all about that, Tom yeah, Summerfield thanks. and Richard Potter. Thank you for joining me and Dave Alanta here at the AWS Summit in London. Much more to come on the Cube.